Let's imagine that you're storming Area 51 on September 20th, ready to catch sight of those elusive aliens, no matter what the government plans on doing to you. As you see a government official striding toward you, you pull out the most important tool in your arsenal. You Naruto run as fast as you possibly can, accelerating at impossible, improbable speeds toward the heart of Area 51. Let's talk about acceleration. <laughs> Welcome back to Fast Physics, where I talk about pretty stupid scenarios in order to talk about topics in physics. My name is Maggie, my age is one and a half decades, and I currently have a chopped off nail because I was using a cleaver wrong, which does not happen that often, don't worry. In the last video, we talked about Area 51 velocity and speed. Go check it out if you haven't seen it yet. We saw that speed is the distance you travel in a certain amount of time, and that velocity is changed in position over time, giving it a direction as well as a magnitude. Your instantaneous velocity on a position time graph is the slope of the line, while instantaneous speed is the slope's absolute value. Finally, finding the area of the space between the velocity timeline and the x-axis gives you our displacement. Okay, so back to Area 51. In our scenario from the last video, you never actually breached it, but today you have. Let's say that you jog past the entrance of Area 51, past whatever defenses that are there, at a constant velocity of 3 meters per second. Let's graph that on a position time graph, shall we? Let's make your frame of reference the entrance, so you start off at 0 meters past the entrance. You jog at that speed for 2 seconds, but then you spot that government official. You pause your jogging for a second to prepare yourself, and then you whip out that Naruto running, and your velocity increases by 1 meter per second every second. So your position changes by 1 meters per second, then 2 meters per second, then 3 meters per second, and so on. Now, let's transfer all of that to a velocity time graph. The slope of this line here is 3 meters per second, so let's graph a straight line at 3 meters per second for 2 seconds. You paused over here upon spotting that official, so your velocity was zero. Then, for these last five seconds, your velocity was constantly changing at a rate of one meter per second every second. So we see here that your instantaneous velocity at four seconds was one meter per second, and two meters per second at five seconds, then all the way up to five meters per second at eight seconds. So that's just a straight line with a slope of one for these last five seconds of the graph. When we were looking at that position time graph earlier, the slope of the graph was the way that we found our instantaneous velocity, which we could transfer to our velocity time graph. That's because the definition of velocity is change in position over time, which is exactly what slope was in that graph. Remember, slope is rise over run, which was change in position over time in that graph. Now, when we look at the slope of our velocity time graph here, that gives us our acceleration. Acceleration is defined as change in velocity over time, so once again, that fits the slope of our graph. Rise is a change in velocity, and run is time, so finding the slope of our velocity time graph should give us our acceleration. Let's ignore all these flat lines where there isn't any acceleration happening. The rise or change in velocity is zero, so there's no acceleration. And look at the last five seconds of our graph. The slope is one, so that's where our acceleration is. One meter per second of increase for every second, so our unit is meters per second squared. So we can graph that last part of your journey as constant acceleration at a rate of one meters per second squared. Your acceleration was one meters per second squared for that part of your journey, but what about for your entire journey? We can find your average acceleration by dividing your total change in velocity by the total time. That would mean your final velocity minus your initial velocity, or the change in your velocity, divided by the entire time in the graph. So that's 5 minus 3 divided by 8, or 1 fourth meters per second squared. If we remember the rules about significant figures, we know that the number of sig figs in our answer can only equal the number of sig figs in our least precise measurement that went into our calculation. So we have to round our answer to one sig fig. 1 fourth equals 0 0.25, which is rounded to 0 0.3. So our average acceleration was 0 0.3 meters per second squared. Now, what stopped you in your path earlier? Let's say that you saw a UFO dropping out of the sky, falling towards you, and let's make your position the reference point for the position of the UFO. It was hovering in space at 58.8 meters above you, then started falling towards you. Gravity on Earth has a pull of 9.8 meters per second squared, meaning that the speed of an object falling will increase by 9.8 meters per second every second. On our graph here, we can see that going down the y-axis brings us smaller and smaller values. So usually movement downwards is shown as decreasing on a graph. So our position time graph will look something like this. Basically half of a parabola with the aliens landing on you after 3 seconds. Now, what about our velocity time graph? Well, we know that an extra 9.8 meters per second of speed is added onto the speed of the UFO every second. But as we said earlier, it's falling towards you, so the velocities will be negative. Once again, we're seeing the difference between speed and velocity. The speed of the UFO is increasing because it's covering more and more distance, which can't be negative because it doesn't take direction into account. While the velocity of the UFO is decreasing because it's heading downwards, which is usually expressed as a negative value. 
So let's check the instantaneous velocities of our position time graph. Final position minus initial position over time. So that's 49 meters minus 58.8 .8 meters is negative 9.8 meters divided by one second. Then 29.4 minus 49 is negative 19.6 etc. So we see here that our velocity is a straight line with a slope of negative 9.8. So as we found out earlier, that's also the acceleration of the alien spaceship, negative 9.8 meters per second squared. So acceleration is in fact a vector quantity. That means it has both magnitude and direction. So you should keep in mind that an object can be accelerating even if its speed stays the same. If it's changing direction, then it's considered to be accelerating. Thanks for watching this video and I hope that you guys will stick around for the next, which will be introducing kinematic equations. Bye!